All right then, welcome back everybody. This is the Creation Liberty Podcast, show number 26 for February 13th, 2011. My name is Chris Johnson, the founder of Creation Liberty Evangelism, and our purpose is to win the loss to Christ and to teach the truth of God's Word and science. Uh, we believe that God's Word is true and accurate historically and scientifically. We also believe in the literal account of Genesis, that the world was created roughly 6,000 years ago in six literal 24-hour days, just like it says. And we not only believe that evolution is a dumb theory, but we also believe it is a dangerous and destructive religion. And we're willing to defend that on this show. So if you're watching a recording from YouTube, you can always join us in live chat Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at www.creationliberty.com. You just click on the link that says podcast and I'll take you straight over. So, uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, I keep finding that there are more and more people. We've, we've been asking for people... Um, who want to come on and present evidence for evolution. You know, we're all paying for, I mean, we're paying for the textbooks, we're paying for the public school systems where they are teaching evolution, and continually I keep asking for any evolutionist to come on and discuss the evidence for evolution on, live on our show. Um, we have had zero takers. Nobody will do this. Um, even the people that have come on our show as guests so far have refused to do it. Um, nobody wants to do it. Uh, everybody wants to sit behind their computer screen where they're nice and comfortable, you know, where they can, you know, uh, where they don't have to give their name and they don't have to, uh, you know, actually defend what they're saying. Uh, they just want to sit behind their computer screen where they have, you know, they can, uh, they don't have to face anybody. And that's that's kind of the point that I'm getting to here. Uh, just like, you know, many uh, professors, you know, I know in Indiana, there's a group here in Indiana who's been asking for professors willing to defend the evolution theory uh, here in Indiana. I think for the past six years, they've been they've been continually searching for someone to do a debate nobody will do it. Um, and for the same reason I think Richard Dawkins won't debate either. Uh, Richard Dawkins refuses to debate on evolution because they don't have any evidence. Uh, and they don't want to put it on, they don't want to put themselves in a position next to a Christian who can say, yes, there is no evidence for evolution whatsoever. They don't want to put themselves in that situation because they know they would lose. I mean, evolution is, I mean, they don't have any evidence. So, of course, nobody's going to stand up and defend it. So I'm sorry for those of you who really want wanted to see more of the creation evolution topic on this show. I've been looking for people to do it for uh, since early December, and we've had absolutely no takers whatsoever. Uh, we have a growing list now of people who are refusing to come on our show to discuss the creation evolution topic. Uh, so anyway, today what I decided to do, uh, we're going to cover a little bit on the evolutionist religious claims about whale evolution. We'll get to that later, and if we have time, we're also going to get into a few of the illogical fallacies that were used by our atheist guest last week uh, concerning how, you know, he, th he believes that his unreliable brain is reliable, but then turns around and says, no, it's not reliable, but I can rely on it <laughs> to, to detect unreliability. Uh, it's very interesting how he uh, kind of argues back and forth on both sides of his mouth there. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that later if we have time. But I want to thank uh, Creation Today, uh, which is the ministry, uh, Creation Ministry in Florida, um, for uh, they helped me get wind of a show called Inside Nature, Nature's Giants. I think I have that right. It's a, apparently a new show they've been doing on PBS, um, and I appreciate them uh, letting me know about that. They did an episode that I took a look at today. Uh, I didn't watch the whole thing. I watched portions of it to see what they were doing. I just wanted to see the giant shark. Apparently they had uh, captured, well, it wasn't really captured. It was dead. They had a net, I think, that was up protecting a residential area, and they... Uh, this uh, great white shark, 15-foot great white shark, gets caught in a net um, and ends up, you know, they end up taking it in and dissecting it, checking all this stuff out. Well, this show, what's interesting about it, and I think is quite comical, is that they'll have uh, Richard Dawkins on for about 10 minutes on each episode, and he explains how the animal evolved from such and such creature. He comes on there, he'll say, well, you see this skin here, this skin uh, does this and this, and then that might have evolved from a creature that kind of had that type of skin but kind of didn't and that evolved from a creature that didn't have that skin so you see how their evolution works i mean the, from the 10 from the when the guy starts when richard dawkins starts his explanation to the 10 minutes his like 10 minute segment is up it's a joke i mean the guy is absolutely comical because he presents absolutely no ev i mean well he'll show physically on the screen i mean the second he says here you see this animal blah 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 all right, that is where his science stops. The rest of everything he says is absolute speculation, and it, it's so funny to watch. So if you check that out uh, on PBS, I can actually give you the website in a minute. Maybe I'll, I'll put that on the uh, comments on YouTube if you guys want to check that out. But uh, anyway, they found this 15-foot great white shark, and that's what the whole um, uh, episode was about until the very end. Now, the very end of the show was what actually shocked me. I could not believe. The lady's name on there, I think, uh, was it Joy... 
Reidenberg, I think is her name. There's, I, I think I can't remember if she's a biologist or veterinarian, whatever she is on there. Uh, it's it's their expert they go to, their animal expert. And uh, I could not believe what she said at the end of this episode. And you know what? I'm not even going to give any details. Let's uh, let me switch this over real quick, and I'm go I'm just going to show you. Um, what is on here? Uh, that's not what we're going to discuss. Let me get... Wait, where did I put it? Here it is. Okay. All right, there we go. Uh, this is what we're going to look at right now. Give me just a second, and I will pull this up here. Let's go at full screen. There we go. All right, let's take a listen and, and see what she says. Back in New York, Joyce focuses on human anatomy. She investigates how similar <clears throat> we are very different animals. Amazingly, in our bodies, she sees signs of an inner fish. This is hilarious. I mean, you might not think that there's a lot in common between us and a fish. They're very different looking. They've got scales, they don't have arms, they don't have legs. But in fact, if you look closely, there actually is a lot All right, now, in common. Now watch what she does here. We have a fishy past. embryos of three-day-old zebrafish. Because they're transparent, you can see all of the organs right through it. You can see its heart beating right over here. Here's the eye. Here's where all the guts are. That's the digestive tract coming out to here. And there's its spine. But the area we're going to look at is right over here, where the gills form. And that's a fascinating area for us because the beginnings of the gills forming are little bumps. You might this has nothing to do with human development, but in fact, humans go through a very similar phase where we also make all of these same little bumps. I brought here a model of a human embryo. Of course, it's very enlarged. A real human embryo at this stage would be very, very tiny. And we notice that there are these little gill bumps or gill arches. So those same structures that became gills in fish in us become part of our respiratory tract, but we're not using them just to breathe. We're using them to make sounds instead. Now, did you notice what she just said there? We're not using them just to breathe. That's what she said. And I'll give you the, hold on, the website here, uh, this is at pbs.org slash program slash inside dash natures dash giants. And you can go uh, look that up. I'll, I'll, I'll try to provide a link to that uh, in the comments on YouTube if you go back and watch this video. What was amazing to me was that she actually... Uh, she actually, what, what she did there was said, uh, implied that we are breathing through these as if these are, these are gill uh, pouches and that humans go through the same evolutionary process that fish do. That's exactly what she's talking about. It's called recapit recapitulates phylogeny is the long term for it. It just basically means, uh, well, actually, you know, I'm just going to show you here in just a second. Let me pull up uh, something on this. What she just used was an argumentation that was proven wrong 135 years ago and they're still teaching this. It's taught in all the major textbooks, in all the major colleges that I've ever seen. They teach this over and over. Um, in fact, I think it was confirmed, I can't remember if it was in 2002 or whatever, the last time I remember, you know, Berkeley, they, they teach this kind of thing. Uh, and they're considered, you know, one of the most prestigious colleges in the world, uh, Berkeley, and they're still teaching, you know, the embryo has gill slits. And uh, let me pull this up on here real quick, and uh, we'll see if we can get that going. Now this is, um, I'm going to show you a couple slides here. This is a, a textbook, you know, uh, chapter 14, the entire chapter covering evolution. It says it's, there's evidence from development. That's what they're talking about here. Now the similarity between the early stages of, in the development of many different animals helped convince Darwin, this is a quotation from this, that all forms of life shared common ancestors. This is from the BSCS from 1978. Of course, they have done uh, updates to this, and I have read the most recent BSCS, and it is full of BS, I assure you. Okay, There's a whole lot of evolution propaganda in this, but, and, and not much has changed since this right here. But they said this, this is one of the things, uh, Darwin considered this one, one of the best class of facts in favor of his theory, the embryo having gill slits. Uh, and that's, uh, you can read about that in the book Icons of Evolution. Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. This says, for example, all vertebrate embryos, including humans, possess the following fish-like structures at some stage of their development. Gill, gill slits, a tail, two-chamber heart, blah, blah, blah. And these models for the, for the embryo turning into the fish and the embryo turning into the human, 
This is exactly what the what this uh, Joy Reidenberg, that's exactly what she just did on the show. It says, the presence of these fish-like structures in embryos of different species, it's talking about humans there, shows, shows what? That these animals have evolved from fish and share the same basic pattern of fish development. Okay, that's what they keep teaching. These do not have anything to do with breathing. Okay, Joy Reidenberg is either ignorant about her anatomy or she's lying trying to get some sort of idea across on these students. Okay, or on the viewers in general, basically, because they have a whole bunch of students that they teach on the show if you take a look at it. But this is, um, these uh, form into glands in the ear and bone, or excuse me, bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They don't have anything to do with breathing whatsoever. But that's exactly what she just implied if you go back and look at it. And that, that last thing was just saying, you know, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of fat folks with a lot of chins, and they can't th breathe through any of, them, any of them but the top one. But she implied in there, and I'll go back, you know, go back and listen to it again. She said, you know, uh, we don't just use them for breathing. That's what she said. Ernst Haeckel read Dar Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, and he liked it, and he knew there needed to be some evidence. He says, we have a great theory here, but we don't have any evidence. So he decided to fabricate some evidence. And what he did, he, he drew embryos and he faked the embryo, he faked the drawings and he made them look alike. This is a, his drawings of a human embryo, the, the human ones on the right and the dog ones on the left, okay? These are Haeckel's drawings and he, and he lied, he faked and changed them and made them look alike. The, at the top, these are his drawings and at the bottom are actual photographs of these creatures taken a few years ago. He lied, okay? There's no easy way around this one. He lied about this. And these same exact charts have been taught in, in colleges even in the last century, or excuse me, in the last decade. Uh, now, this is um, a quote from uh, Dr. Everett Brook that was uh, quoting um, Ernst Henkel, and he said, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. This is a quote from when Jenna University, they, they put him on trial and convicted him of fraud because he lied about his evidence, okay? Now, these, his actual drawings were still being used in, in uh, University of West Florida in 1999 in their evolutionary analysis book. This is uh, Hope Biology still teaching it in 1994. Department of Zoology, Ohio State University, 1990, using these, this embryo having gill slits as evidence for evolution. Um, this is uh, Glencoe Biology still teaching it. This is uh, uh, Biology, A Journey into Life, Arms, and Camp, 1991. They're still teaching it. Uh, 1998, Hope, Bi Hope Biology, Science Book, still teaching embryos have gill uh, embryos of the human having gill slits. Um, biology Concepts and Applications, 2000, teaching it. Uh, Discover Biology, 2000. Your Apprentice Hall, 2001, still teaching this. Uh, you know, Hope Biology, 2001. Here's a University of Science and Arts in Oklahoma, 2005, still teaching the embryo and the human has gill pouches. You have to lie on your SAT or, or you won't get into a good college. You gotta lie and say that the embryo has gill slits on the SAT. It says gill slits and tails are found in fish, chicken, pig, and human embryos. All these say they have gill slits like a fish. Uh, and I, I put it down to people that this says, Behold, the angel of the Lord said, Thou art with fetus. No, it said, Thou art with child. Okay, it's not, you know, and that's, this is what they're using to justify abortion. That's why they won't take this out of the textbooks. They need this to justify abortion and to try to, you know, say, Hey, kids, look, evolution's true. Look, we have, we have gill slits when we're, when we're growing up in the mother's womb. And, and here, it's still a child, by the way. I want to, I want to make, uh, reiterate that point. This is a, a 21 week old baby. He's less than five months old and they had to do surgery on the baby while it was still in the womb and it, when they cut the mother open the baby reached out and grabbed the doctor's finger at you know less than five months old. It's still a baby okay at conception and so the the point being that you know they need this to justify abortion they need this I mean that's the only evidence they've got for evolution so of course they're gonna keep it in the textbooks I mean why wouldn't they but you see folks a hundred it's 135 years. I know it takes a while for textbooks to get up to date, but I think 135 years is long enough. I think we need to do something about this, okay? And uh, there certainly should not be teaching it on, on, a, on PBS like there and acting as if they're talking about science. You've got to be kidding me. That's science falsely so-called it talks about in 1 Timothy. So, um, but let's see here. I just want to make mention of that. You guys can go back and watch that if you want. Like I said, I'll put a, I'll put a link in the... Uh, in the comments there, if I remember to do it. Hopefully I'll remember to do that. Anyway, I want to go on and uh, cover some stuff about whale evolution. I wrote quite a few articles this week uh, talking about this subject, 
And uh, there's a few select things they were using to try to say that, um, you know, the whole, the whole thing, or excuse me, the whole um, concept they're trying to get across is that fish evolved slowly over, over millions and millions of years. They slowly evolved into creature, creatures that walk around on land. And then those creatures went back into the water, lost their legs, grew fins, and became whales. I'm not making this up. That is what they believe. Okay. Even though we have no evidence for this whatsoever, uh, there's an awful lot of evolutionists that still believe this, and that's and it's taught in the public school system because again, you know, what else do they have? They a lot of the stuff is kept in the textbooks just because they don't have anything else to replace it to get the children to believe in evolution, so they have to keep the stuff in there. And one of the ones we're going to talk about today is uh, Ambulocetus. They use this as evidence for evolution. They say Ambulocetus. Uh, this is a uh, excuse me, from, actually this is also from PBS, their evolution library, you can go look this up on their website, under whale evolution. They said, quote, it's the tale of an ancient land mammal making its way back into the sea, becoming the forerunner of today's whales. In doing so, it lost its legs and all of its vital systems became adapted to a marine existence, the reverse of what happened millions of years previously. That's what I just explained. When the first animals crawled out of the sea onto land, another slightly more recent form called Ambulocetus was an amphibious animal. Okay, So Ambulocetus is one of the ones they claim uh, went into the water, it lost its legs and grew fins, went into the water and became a whale. And this is a textbook that's teaching this right here. This is a more uh, modern uh, public school textbook that's teaching that this creature evolved into this one. This is a picture of the Ambulocetus skeleton. Now what I'm showing you right here, you need to understand, this is the evolutionist model right here on top. The evolutionist model of what they drew. Below right here are the actual bones that were discovered and those that you're seeing in red, these were bones that were found uh, 15 feet above where they found the rest of the skeleton. Okay, See like for example this tail that they're forming on the end here, the whole, they are drawing this entire tail on there from one tiny piece of tailbone they found that was 15, or excuse me, 5 meters above where the rest of the skeleton was found. That's what they're basing the whole thing on. So this is all they found, and they're claiming that this is evidence that land-dwelling mammals evolved into whales. Okay, And then they create these artist depictions of this creature, You know what they think happened. They always draw them diving into the water and catching fish. Keep that in mind, because we're going to see that come back up in, in just a minute. Um, and let me see here. Uh, let's see here. It, it, well, this is what it said on uh, from the PBS website again on uh, under their article Whale Evolution. They said its forelimbs were equipped with fingers and small hooves. Now I'm not sure where exactly they're pulling that from, but that's what they claim. The hind feet of Ambulocetus, however, were clearly adapted for swimming. Functional uh, analysis of its skeleton shows that it could get around efficiently on land and could swim by pushing back with its hind feet and uh, undiluting its tail as otters do today. However, they have no evidence of this. All they're claiming, they believe that that's what they did with it. But look, this is uh, from, um, <clears throat> this is quoted, referring back to, uh, Brian Thomas refers back to uh, Johannes uh, Thuisens, and this is a guy, you're going to see this guy's name come up all the time, because he was a discoverer of uh, some of the uh, bones they found, uh, including uh, this one here, the skeletal model that you're seeing here. This is the one he discovered. Uh, and he says, but what, it, what is not revealed is that Ambulocetus illustrated as a possible transitional link to the modern whale is missing its key body parts. He's right. They don't portray that since the pelvic girdle is not preserved. They don't have the key body parts to tell them what this thing is going to be, what, what it could do. They have no idea. Plus, we need to understand, before I even go any further, I want to read what I wrote right here. I'm just going to read this verbatim because this will, will explain the situation. Before we go any further, we need to clarify that no fossils can possibly be considered as evidence for evolution. Now, the evolutionists hate it when I bring this up, okay? But it's true. If a scientist finds a bone in the dirt, there is only one thing he knows for certain. It died. He doesn't even know where it died. He only knows where it ended up getting buried. That's it, okay? It could have died somewhere else and gotten buried there later. And that's what would happen in a flood. Uh, there is no way for a scientist to prove that the bones he found in the dirt had any children that lived. So he can't say that it's an ancestor of anyone. He could, even if a scientist could prove that this creature had, had a child, like they could tell from the bone structure, oh yes, this creature had a child, they couldn't prove the child lived. I mean, th there's no way you can prove hardly anything conclusively. You definitely can't prove any kind of ancestry relationship from finding bones in the ground. Now this is Dr. Angela Meyer from uh, her article, The World 
uh, the world of whales, she said major conclusions uh, uh, were made about its mode of walking, about its tail structure, and yet the important fibula bones, pelvis, and tail bones were not found. So why are they drawing these conclusions when they haven't found them? Um, the researchers assumed the skeleton was of a whale. They assumed a long tail for Amblycetus, you know, because the whole point is they, they had to put a tail on it because they already thought it was a whale, so they said, well, let's stick the tail on it because they need something to be a missing link between land animals and whales for their evolution model to work, and that's really the problem. They're making major assumptions over off of a few bones that were found, and they don't even know what they're talking about. Now, moving on, this one we're covering is Pachycetus evidence for evolution. And for any of you Christians out there that are watching this and are interested in this kind of thing, go to my website, uh, click on Q&A. There's a section on whale evolution right there. You can find all these articles, and you can click the recommend button right here at the top, and that'll send it over to you know your different friends on Facebook. Pass these around. My, my material is not copyrighted, so pass it around and send it who, to who you want. Um, now, this one, uh, this is Pachycetus is what we're talking about here. Now, you have to understand, this is from... Uh, Let's see here, uh, Daniel Patrick, or Pent uh, uh, Pendick, Pendick, excuse me, Daniel Pendrick. I said Daniel Patrick, I don't know why. Anyway, it says, uh, Better Traces of Whale Pedigree Discovered. That's the article he wrote. This is from Science Services and Gale Group um, <clears throat> that they wrote, uh, that he wrote this back in the 1990s when this was discovered. He says, Now fossils uncovered in Pakistan provide the best evidence to date of the radical evolutionary changes from land-dwelling mammals to uh to land-dwelling creatures to whales, okay? This is considered, by far, according to the evolution model, the best evidence for evolution, for, for the evolution of land-dwelling mammals to whales. This is one of their best evidences they use. Uh, concerning Pachycetus, uh, this uh, Thuisen, again, the guy that we talked about earlier, he says, I think for the first time there is what you could call a missing link. He's saying that this, in 1990, he says that this is the first time the missing link has been discovered. So even the evolutionists themselves know there are no missing links. And then he goes on to say, if there is such a thing as a missing link, because he doesn't even know, between the, the hearing mechanism of the marine mammal and the terrestrial mammal, that's what they're claiming is their, their best evidence for evolution. And Pachycetus has been cited as evidence that the earliest uh, these creatures uh, radiated slowly uh, in productive shallow waters between Asia and India approximately 53 million years ago. So this picture you're looking at here is a slide that I retrieved from a, uh, it's basically present, there's a whole set, whole big sets of presentations on evolution that comes from the Indiana University website, because I live here in Indiana. So uh, the Indiana, Indiana University website has this on their website for teachers to download and use to teach their children about, the children in their class about evolution. So this is what the students are learning. This is Pachycetus was an early whale 50 million years ago. Uh, now, Pachycetus, okay, on the right, what you're seeing here, if you can see this, this is a, a, an artist rendition of what the guy Gingrich, who found this, found the Pachycetus. What he said he found, okay, and, this, and see how they have him diving into the water and catching fish again? This is the way they always do it. What you're seeing here on the left, this is a completed skull, all right, what they say the Pachycetus was. In the red areas are the bones that were actually discovered. All they found was a couple skull fragments and a few teeth, and they're saying this is the evidence uh, that land dwelling mammals turn into whales. I mean, I, even when I saw this, I couldn't hardly believe it. I was like, this is what they're using as evidence for evolution? You've got to be kidding me. Uh, National Geographic actually had to lie about the description of the findings to sound more convincing that a missing link had been discovered. Watch this. This is from Dr. Terry uh, Mortison, who's referring to the natural, National Geographic article. He said, the fossil evidence at the time only consisted of parts of the skull, yet Gingrich's artist drew the creature swimming in the ocean with front legs like a land animal, but the mouth and rear end looking like a sea creature as it was trying to eat fish. By, uh, but by 2001, more fossils had been found, and it was concluded that Pachycetus was no more amphibious than a tapir, which is a mammal similar, similar to a pig. Continuing, quote, Yet National Geographic misleadingly tells us that Gingrich discovered Pachycetus, a terrestrial mammal, on page 31 of their article. That's not what he called it when he discovered it and wrote about it in the scientific literature, end quote. Now that's, I mean, that's the deception that really has to come into play here because you have to lie. I mean, I, I actually, I think it's great when, when an article like National Geographic lies. I know the Christians will be like, well, that's pathetic that they have to lie. Oh, I agree. But I think it's great when they lie because that proves how desperate they are for, for evidence for evolution when they have to lie about it. Now, on the left is a coyote skull. On the right is, a, is what they call a uh, Pachycetus skull, okay? 
I mean, they look exactly the same. So I don't know where they're coming from with this. And, and even then, again, no fossils can possibly count as evidence for evolution. Again, you can't prove that this, these bones had any children that lived. So you're not going to be able to prove anything from this. But yet they, they deceptively make uh, slides like this to convince children that evolution is true. And I'm, I'm completely against that. Now, another one they use is a Basilosaurus, okay? They call it the last step before the modern whale, Basilosaurus. Okay, this is an um, image uh, from, uh, let's see here, a book called Evolution, the Grand Experiment. Uh, you can get the references off my website. Again, this is under our, uh, if you go click, go to www.creationliberty.com. I'll try to put a, a link to this one, too, to all these in the uh, comment section on YouTube. You can check that out if you want to get the links. Uh, but if you go to our Q&A section under Whale Evolution, you can look up Basilosaurus there. Um, and this is what the this is what was said from evolution the grand experiment they said according to the previously shown whale evolution diagram because they they put all the different ones like basilosaurus and uh, pachycetus and ambulocetus they put them all together because this is how they always do it they said according to the previously shown whale evolution diagram quote basilosaurus was the precursor to modern whales one of the missing links end quote okay so that's what they're claiming. Now this is a picture, I found this is really interesting because this was on the uh, Smithsonian Institute uh, Archives, uh, their website. This is uh, when they first completed the Basilosaurus um, skeleton to put into a museum. This was the first one completed. This picture was taken in 1896. I thought they uh, really digitally remastered that one really well. Uh, but that's, uh, this is uh, from the actual photograph. You can go to their website and check that out. At, I think they're... Um, their website, yeah, it's right here. It's uh, www.mnh.si.edu, and you can go check that out. Uh, but again, no fossil. You find this fossil, this is not evidence for evolution. It can't even be considered as evidence for evolution. If you brought that into a court of law and said, Your Honor, this, these are the bones of uh, the ancestors of, you know, uh, or this is the ancestor of modern whales, I mean, you're going to get laughed out of the court. I mean, anybody can raise their sentence at objection. He doesn't know that that bone has any children whatsoever. All right, your evidence is dismissed. Bring in your next evidence. I mean, that's exactly how the court system would go. But you see, evolution doesn't have to be put into a court of law to be proven. It only has to be made believable to a bunch of students so they will religiously believe it. And that's what's uh, being done right here and it, uh, done right now in the public school system. And it's tragic, and I'm, I'm trying to do something about it. You know, I'm working as hard as I can. But this, is, uh, this says the hind limb... It's talking about the hind limb on Basilosaurus provides a clue to the evolutionary past of Basilosaurus. Because, see, because when I looked at this, I sat there and questioned it. I said, how is this supposed to be evidence for evolution? I mean, I, I don't get that. I said, where are they drawing this from? And uh, then when I read this from the, from the Smithsonian uh, website, when they said the hind limb provides the clue, I said, ah, now I understand what's going on here. See, this, this image, this is from, uh, I think today the Smithsonian may be the only, only museum to have a completed one of these in their museum. I, I think there's, there's other completed skeletons, but no, none of the other museums have one besides the Smithsonian, as far as I understand. Um, but this is uh, from Holt Biology 2001, and I'm quoting here right down at the bottom. This is, I just blew this up to be bigger. It said, hind limb bones that have no function. You see, what they do is they say, okay, these hind limb bones have no function, so therefore they're remnants of the evolutionary past. Now, first of all, I'm going to say, even if these, these bones right here had no function, that doesn't prove an, an evolutionary relationship. Again, I'm going, to, I'm going to say this again for emphasis. If these bones have no function, it does not prove an evolutionary relationship. Okay? It doesn't matter what you believe about them. It can't prove an evolutionary relationship because you don't you can't prove that but those these bones that you found had any children that lived. Now, at the same time, they do have a function, okay? These are these are what help them reproduce. That's how you get more of that of that same kind. And it seemed, uh, this is from Philip Gingrich, again the guy that discovered the uh, Pachycetus bones. He said it seems to me that they could only be some sort of kind of sexual or reproductive clasper. That's what he, he, I mean, he even admitted the functionality of these things, okay? And it's the same thing that they have in whales. Whales today have these same types of little bones that you're seeing right here, okay? They have these on the whales, and that's what the whales use to reproduce. It helps them get baby whales. It does, it's not a proof of evolutionary ancestry. But on this Eyes on Nature, Whales and Dolphins uh, public school textbook, they said, just imagine the whales walking around. It's true. Well, look at these bones, and just imagine the whale walking around. I've tried as hard as I can, and I still can't imagine the whale walking around, okay? 
Now, it, but that is my point exactly. You have to imagine that it takes place. You know, I've seen other textbooks that say, if you can imagine a series of changes of the evolution of the eye, it, that's my point. You have to imagine it in your mind. It doesn't take place in reality. It's a religious speculation. It's pure fairy tale that you have to imagine in your mind. Okay? Now, this is... Um, the same book, this uh, Carl and Debbie Warner from that uh, from Evolution: The Grand Experiment. They're quoting uh, Dr. Lawrence Barnes on here, and he said, do, or they said, Dr. Lawrence Barnes, a whale evolution expert from the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, does not believe Basilosaurus was an ancestor to modern whales because this whale lived at the same time as more more modern forms of whales. Well, how could it have evolved into whales if it was around the same time as whales, whales were around? Something it would have had to evolve from something else if the theory were even true. I mean, it's not, so it doesn't matter. But he continues, and they say, quote, and therefore could not be a precursor. So even, even the, I mean, this Dr. Lawrence Barnes, he believes in evolution, and he stays still saying, look, it can't be a precursor to it. It's not a missing link. Uh, continuing, quote, apparently not all, all agree on Basilosaurus being the last ancestor prior to the evolution of the modern forms of whales, end quote. Okay? So there's still evolutionists that disagree about this stuff. Um, this is Barbara Stahl, uh, Vertebrate History, uh, Problems of Evolution. You can check out her book when she says, The serpentine form of the body, she's talking about a basilosaurus here, and the, pre uh, excuse me, and the peculiar serrated cheek teeth made it plain that these uh, uh, archocetes um, could not have possibly uh, been ancestral to any of the modern whales. All right? Now look, if you want to believe that basilosaurus was a precursor to modern, modern whales, you enjoy yourself, man. You can believe whatever you want, okay? But there is no scientific evidence for that. And don't put that in our schools and start calling it science. And don't put that on your websites and say, this is science. That's not science, okay? That's your religious speculation. So keep that at home and keep that at your own private expense and start your own private school where people have to come pay and learn that. But don't make the rest of us pay for that junk either, okay? Now, this is a, a photograph. I'm not saying that this is a basilosaurus, source, Okay. But this is from Time Magazine. You can uh, check this out. This is in our Seminar 3, Dinosaurs in the Bible. You can go check that out. That's on our, our YouTube uh, channel. It's also on our website. If you go to uh, creationliberty.com, click on videos, you can watch our Seminar 3. We have all sorts of photographs and interesting uh, eyewitness accounts like this. Um, but this is from Time Magazine, March 12, 1934, page 32. Uh, two professors from Paris Natural History Museum analyzed this and said it was not a whale and it was not a sea cow. Uh, so what was it? I don't know, but you know it's possible these kind of creatures still could be around today. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, sightings of a creature called the Ogopogo in uh, British Columbia uh, that they find that. Uh, the Ogopogo, they claim, is all the, all the descriptions claim something very similar to the Basilosaurus. Uh, there's also a gentleman who uh, claimed to have caught a baby one that was 18 inches long. He drew a sketch of it and threw it back in the water. Uh, and that can all be seen on our seminar th number three, Dinosaurs in the Bible. Just go to our video sh section on our website, check that out. You can watch that for free. Um, so it's possible some of these could still be alive today. But again, there's no evidence for this whale evolution, okay? Now, if you want to believe that fish evolved legs and came and evolved into creatures that came on land and they evolved into, you know, uh, into creatures that went into shallow water and dove in and catch fish and they evolved, it lost their legs and evolved fins and became whales, okay, you can believe that. I don't care what you believe, but I'm sick and tired of paying for that religious junk to be taught in the, at the public school system, okay? You need to keep that, keep that home at your own private expense, okay? Now, we're going to take the last few minutes here and go over a couple of things. I guess I just wanted to talk um, to last week's show. Very, very interesting. Um, now, Josh has, uh, I mean, I did not mean to, I wasn't trying to frustrate Josh. I know he was frustrated, and he's been trying to kind of, hide that and tell me that he's not, but it was obvious obvious from the last episode. You could tell he was frustrated when he left. And I'm, I'm sorry he was frustrated, but look, the guy had never, I mean, the guy, uh, he, he studies this at a, at a university in California, okay, and uh, what he told me is he teaches this. I mean, he teaches philosophy and logic at a university in California. Now, as a, as a a person that teaches philosophy and logic at a university of California, and we had to, at the beginning of the show, go look up the definition of no, because he hadn't, I mean, he didn't really understand that it dealt with certainty. I mean, if the guy's been teaching this and is, and is studying this for so long and doesn't even know that, I mean, it's not that I'm, I'm saying that, you know, I'm not trying to say, well, I have superior knowledge or anything. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, why hasn't he even bothered to look this up or, or think about this for a minute? And that really, I mean, as soon as he said that and we looked and he saw where it dealt with certainty and he had never seen that before, that showed me clearly from the beginning he had not really thought about this. 
and and that can be embarrassing if you have if if your profession is in a certain topic, and a, and a lay person like myself because I just I'm not a genius I'm a layman okay I'm just a layman that reads from the geniuses and I study their information and I just translate it so the average person can understand it. If I mean when a lay person comes along and show you shows you that you don't really know what you're talking about on a certain issue that can be embarrassing and so I could see that his frustration really started to build from that point because he saw that it was from certain and you could tell in certain parts of the. Um, the video, you go back and watch it, that he started to say, well, we certainly know, and then he'd stop, and he'd stop himself, because he, he realized that he was saying that he could know things with certainty, but he really had to stay away from that, uh, because that's why he tried to say that his um, definition was justified true belief. Excuse me, uh, your belief has nothing to do with the truth. Uh, it, your belief doesn't prove truth, okay? And when he says it's justified true belief, well, you can't prove anything's true if you just believe it, I mean, that's not really knowledge. I mean, that's a, that's a circular argument, too. There is no person in this country, or, well, at least in this country, I don't know how they do it in other countries, but here, nobody could possibly be prosecuted by the law and sentenced to any kind of, uh, you know, imprisonment or death or anything like that uh, based on his definition of knowledge. I mean, otherwise, we couldn't prosecute anyone. They could say, well, you committed this crime. Look, we have your blood on the weapon and all these kind of things. They said, yeah, but, you know, uh, that's just your, your perspective. That's your belief. I didn't really commit that crime. That's You can't prove that. Well, then we can't. Then we can't prosecute anybody. You see, even even to prosecute somebody for a crime, you can't start from the atheist atheist perspective because you can't know anything for certain. Uh, and that's, that's You can't have any knowledge with, with certain, which is, to me is fascinating because we cannot prosecute people under an atheist worldview. And the average person doesn't stop to think about that. If, if the atheist worldview is true, like, if, for example... I had somebody um, uh, email me. I think it was a friend of Josh's. Uh, he wants to come on our show. At least he claims he does, or he did at one point. That was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I actually don't really believe that he's going to come on our show. I think I may have to add him to our list because um, after he saw the show with Josh, I'm not. He, I don't think he really wants to come on our show. Uh, he's a little scared to, and, uh, and and rightfully so. I mean, if I were an atheist coming onto a show like this. I would be a little scared too because I would not have to want to, you know, try to explain how I can have knowledge but without starting with knowledge already present. I mean, that's, I mean, how do, you, how do you justify that your brain works from an unreliable brain? I would not want to be in that position, and I would definitely not want to come on our show either. So I understand his, his uh, willingness to, uh, or his, basically his decision to kind of stay back from that. So we'll see if he does. If he does, that would be great. I'd be happy to have him on to talk about that, but he's definitely going to have to do a little better than Josh did on that. And now, now Josh, <clears throat> or excuse me, this guy that was, I was talking about, I mean, he asked a really good question. He says, well, then how can you know the Bible is certain if your brain's unreliable? And I said, that's an excellent question, and I was hoping that Josh was going to ask that. Because, I mean, he was so busy trying to defend that he had knowledge, he didn't even miss the question. And the thing is, he's absolutely right. But here's the problem. He's trying to start the Christian off and bring the Christian into the atheist worldview to have a discussion with the atheist, okay? Now, that's the problem. You can't do that. If you, if you analyze any worldview... Any, take your pick. I don't care if you're a Buddhist, Islam, Jew, atheist, whatever. You you analyze any of those worldviews from the atheist position, you've lost before you started the debate. I mean, you're going to lose in the first five seconds, and it's you're, there's nothing you can do. Because analyzing anything from the atheist perspective means you can't prove anything is true. Because you're starting with you're starting with your brain, you're starting with your unreliable brain, which you said, well, yeah, I know it's not reliable because if you know what a mirage is, you're well, my brain is not 100% reliable. So how can you vi verify that your brain is reliable enough to say that you can reliably know anything for certain? Uh, they can't. I mean, there's you've lost at the outset. So the only way to analyze the two worldviews together, like the Christian and the atheist worldview, like what we were doing, is to set them both on equal terms. And you have to say, let's, you know, I'm going to take my position that the Bible is true, and that's our foundation of knowledge, and then your position that the Bible is not true, and, and uh, you use yourself, you're, you're claiming your brain is your foundation of knowledge, and we're going to analyze those and see which one of those gives us logic, okay? The atheist knows they would lose, the, lose automatically. They can't have them on equal planes. So what they have to do is try to pull people into their atheist worldview of circular reasoning, never to know whether they can know anything for true, is certain or not, and then try to claim, you know, and then try to analyze things through that. And they can't analyze anything. They can't verify anything is true. So it's no wonder that the atheists can't find God because they keep analyzing from an atheist perspective, which means you can't verify that you have any knowledge. And that becomes the problem, okay? So how can we know? Well, I told, I told this guy on, that we were talking over email. I won't give his name yet because, you know, he hasn't agreed to come on the show. But 
you know, I told him on there, I said, if you, if you start it off there, then, I mean, the Christian and the atheist both lose. And, he, and basically he did the exact same thing that Josh did. He basically said, well, that's just wrong. It's just not true. Yeah, but you don't know how it's not true. I mean, you don't have any justification for knowledge, so how are you going to do that? I mean, the whole thing is a really a circular joke. Atheism really becomes a circular joke, and I know they, they're going to hate me saying that, and, well, you can hate me all you want. I'm just the messenger, okay? I'm just giving you the message. That's it. Um, it is a joke, and if you want to believe in that, great. You go ahead and believe whatever you want, okay? But don't try to, don't try to sit back and say, atheists are logical and the Christians are, are just dumb. No, don't sit back and say that because you can't verify that. You don't have, any, you don't have a justification for knowledge. Now, the, the Christian can rely on the, or the, take the reliability of logic and reason in the brain because there was a God that created the brain to be reasonable. So that way we can see that there's a mirage, and we can go analyze it and say, ah, that's a mirage, and I know I was just seeing something that wasn't actually there. And that way you can verify that your brain works because you know there is a God who created reason, created logic, and created the mind. And that's the one thing, when I saw all these different comments of these atheists coming out, and they were so mad about what we were talking about on there, and none of them would admit that's what we're starting with. They said, oh, you're starting... But you, basically, you're starting by analyzing the Bible. No, no, no. That's not where I started. I started with, there is an all-powerful, omniscient, all-powerful God who is super intelligent. He created our knowledge. He created the brain. He created reason. He created logic. Okay? That's where I'm starting from. I'm starting where the, it is designed. And if the brain is designed, I mean, you have to stop and think about it. The, if logic and reason are designed, then the brain has to be designed to analyze logic and reason. The brain cannot really, I mean, what use is the brain without logic and reason? And what use is logic and reason without the brain? So they were both designed for each other. It's also a symbiotic relationship between the two. But the atheist wants to just sit there and say it's out there and then claim that, well, I understand reason. I Look how enlightened I am. Look how smart I am. That's why they call it, you know, I've heard so many people refer to themselves as the enlightened thinkers because they're atheists. <laughs> just, well, it just keeps proof of the Bible true in Roman, the first chapter of Romans. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And it's, it's absolute foolishness. It's circular foolishness. Um, so anyway, I see people on there where they're giving explanations. Oh, gosh, what was the one atheist that came on there? And, uh, oh, man, I can't believe... I can't remember what he said. I should have I pulled some of these up and, and taken a look at them uh, because some of the claims they were making are so ridiculous. And they would say, well, you're using a logical fallacy. Well, how did you prove that? Did you use your unreliable brain to say that I have uh, that there's a logical fallacy? You can't claim there's a logical fallacy. You can't claim logic or anything illogical because you're using your thoughts. You're, you're saying my thoughts are reliable enough to analyze my thoughts to say my thoughts are reliable. That's one of the most absolutely hopelessly circular things I've ever seen, and I absolutely cannot accept that. The only way to do it, to, to have a discussion about the issue, you have to put them on equal, pl equal planes and analyze and see which one gives you logic, or basically you have to do what mo almost every atheist does. They borrow from the Christian worldview. They borrow by saying knowledge and logic and reason and all that they can rely upon, so they borrow from the Christian worldview in order to tell them uh, in order to uh, have a discussion with a Christian. They're using the Christian worldview to try to tell the, the Christians that the Christian worldview is incorrect. <laughs> I'm, wow, I just you know, couldn't believe that. And then one of the atheists, you know, they claimed that, uh, you know, they said, well, atheism isn't, uh, isn't a, a religious aspect. You know, they just, you know, there's no set direction that it has. Oh, yes, yes, they all believe that their knowledge, I mean, they all, their mind becomes God. They themselves, I mean, even that's what the humanists believe. There's all sorts of humanists that believe they can become God or that we are gods, you know. And I can give you all sorts of quotations about that. I do that in my seminar number five. Uh, but the thing is, you know, yes, they do. They do believe one specific thing, and that is that their minds are reasonable and reliable and, and knowledgeable in order to have discussions and things like that. And they can't prove that at all because they're starting with their brain first, and that really becomes the problem. So basically, I mean, and, and of course they're going to, I mean, of course all the, he says, well, atheists, you know, they believe all sorts of things. There's atheists that, you know, do this and that, and they argue about all sorts of things. Well, of course they do. Get a bunch of chickens, blindfold them, stick them in a dark room, and let them loose. They're going to go all sorts of directions, okay? Of course they're not going to go in one direction. Duh. But all, but all the atheists that are blindfolded in, a, in the dark woods, you know, trying to bumble around and, and find, you know, one particular twig out of the entire forest, I mean, they have no idea where they're going. 
And it's really a scary thought because once they have to, once they acknowledge that, they know full well that they can't have a discussion. And even if you look at uh, the other Josh, there's a Josh that was on the uh, the debates we did, or, or the debates I posted for um, from Gene Cook's show from the from the Narrow Mind. If you listen to that, he says, if I don't assume my brain to work, I'm quoting him, okay, because I remember him saying this. I was so shocked that he said this. He says, if I don't assume my brain to work, then I'm not even going to have to talk with you. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to. I'm not even going to talk with anybody. Josh was actually correct in that debate. At least he was honest, honest enough to admit that if he doesn't assume that, he can't have a discussion. And that assumption is based on the Christian worldview that we can rely on our thoughts because we have an all-powerful, omniscient God who created them. But they have no justification for that, for that assumption. It's just it, it's a purely religious. They, believe, they think they don't have a religion, but they absolutely do. So I find that very fascinating. Anyway, we got through all the subjects I really wanted to uh, get to today. If any of you guys have any questions at all, feel free to email me, okay? My email is on my website. Uh, there's a couple, basically, you really need to go to the contact page on my website. I, I, that's why I usually don't hand out my email on the show. You need to go to the contact page because there's a couple things that you have to make sure that you include in the email or you're not even going to get a response from me. I get, I mean, before I actually posted this contact, um, these, uh, the two rules that I require for people to contact me, um, I used to get all sorts of unsigned emails, and what they would do is they would send me like, you know, 10, 20 questions on there. And I would go back and I would start to answer each one of the questions, and they'd never get back with me. They purposefully wanted to waste my time. They didn't really want an answer. They just wanted to waste my time, and they, and they purposely did that just to waste it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't accomplishing anything. So instead of having people waste my time, uh, I still occasionally have someone that will email me and do that. But, you know, I, now I told them, I said, I'm not even going to answer to you unless you provide uh, some basic information. So, anyhow, uh, go to my contact page, but I don't want that people, I don't want, you know, these rules that I have on there to put in the email to scare people off. All I'm doing is asking for a name and location. Like I say, my name is Chris, I'm from Indiana. Is that so hard? I mean, uh, you need to understand we're dealing with real people here. We're not dealing with pixels on a computer screen. We're dealing with real people, all right? And uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's much to ask, but I tell you what, it does scare enough people away that they don't want to email me. And the Bible says that men like darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And that, you know, that makes sense why. They don't want to give their name. There's a whole bunch of people that have refused to debate me. They don't even want to give me their name, let alone to come on the show and have a discussion with me over uh, the evolution issue because they don't have any evidence for evolution. So, of course, they're not going to want to come in and do that. But anyway... Go ahead, email me if you guys got any questions about the whale evolution thing. If you have qu more questions about the atheist Christian debate, or you want to talk about any of these other issues, I'll be happy to discuss them with you. And I'll be happy to talk about them on the show. If you'll just contact me, send me an email, send your questions. We'll discuss them right here on the show. And uh, anyway, for next week, uh, next week's show, I'm thinking it was, I can't remember what date. Oh, that's going to be the 20th. Yeah, It'll be show number 27 for the 20th. We have planned, I'm going to have a, an old friend of mine. Um, I, ha I don't have too many friends I've known for years and years, but I've known this guy for about 15 years. His name's Ian. Uh, he lives here in Indiana. He's going to uh, come out to my house, and we're going to visit because I haven't seen him in a while. And we're going to discuss, very interestingly enough, the issue of tithe. Is tithe a biblical requirement of Christians? And I have a, a whole article on my website uh, that you can read on the tithing issue that, no, it is not a New Covenant gospel. Um, they're teaching uh, old, old doctrine from the law. Uh, when they're teaching, uh, when when Christian churches are teaching tithe, and that that really confuses me because this is something that I, you know, the Lord's really only shown me recently, and I just couldn't believe it when I was reading all the different scriptures in the New Covenant that just blow away a requirement of tithe that you, you're not required to do that kind of thing. But they keep teaching these storehouse tithing sermons to try to convince people that they are. And Ian's going to come on the show and not just uh, talk about this with me. Uh, that the tithing is not a requirement. We're also going to show how the same concept of the tithing is similar to taxation and also has some similarities to some of the, uh, uh, basically, the, the bad governmental um, setups that are made in uh, uh, communism. Uh, the same kind of things that they do in a communist nation are the same kind of things that are being done within the churches with the tithing issue, and they're always arguing and, and pressuring people based on the law and not the New Covenant Gospel. So we're going to talk about that next week. That's going to be fascinating. I really hope you guys will join us. If you have any questions on that issue, please make sure to, uh, to uh, email me. You can also join our Facebook discussion group, and you can uh, post those there, and uh, we will discuss those on the show. So anyway, join us next week. That'll be uh, Monday. 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, just like it always is. You can join us in chat, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for joining us.